men's and women's roles in the home have definitely evolved over time, like what our parents did compared to how involved dads and things are now. And I think your dad was probably ahead of his time in the way he served his your served yeah. your mom. I mean, he did a lot more around the house based on what you've told me than like oh, yeah. my dad ever did. Yeah, and yeah. So I think he had a good example. Yeah, and he yeah. would always say, and he'd get it, he'd recruit us. <laughs> hey, I need you to do this and this and this. And I think my dad really modeled how do you do it? How do you serve and serve well? Uh, and that would be the thing that I would encourage guys to do is like, I mean, lay down your life by serving as Jesus did for you. And the return on that is huge. The bliss that goes along with that. You gotta be very intentional to serve. And when you when you just think that way and you approach your lot your each day that way, it just compounds over time. It becomes who you are and then it becomes a lot easier. And so when we when you get that, you understand that and you go, okay, now how do I live that? A little hack, and I've told this plenty of times, but I try to make my wife's coffee every day. For me, it's my intentional statement of I'm here to serve you. Right? And it's not to tell her that, it's as much to tell me that, right? And dude, your job is to serve. It just makes me feel appreciated. I mean, I have to be at work at 7.30. I leave the house at 7.10, use school. I have my daughter with me. I either take her to school or I drop her off to carpool and my mornings are rushed. I mean, he knows it takes a lot of time to dry hair and do all this. <laughs> it takes girls a lot longer to get out the door. And so when I walk out the door in my rush, usually, you know, running out the door one minute late, here's my coffee, here's my lunch, here's Carson's lunch already packed. And it just makes you feel appreciated for what you're doing. He's not taking advantage, he doesn't take for granted the sacrifices that I make for our family. I mean, you just can't go wrong in marriage by saying, hey, I'm here to serve you. What, are you. what do you need? How can I serve you today? If she'll serve me the more than she serves herself, she's doing her part. And if I'll serve her more than I serve myself, I'm doing my part. And part of what happens when you're, when you're coming together is you, you bring all that you are, your baggage, your, your preferences, your selfishness, and so does the other person. And the, the key to this whole deal going is that I've got too much of me and me, and I gotta take that to Jesus. I've gotta lay that down so that I can be for her what he wants me to be. It's really Christ formed in me that helps me serve her. And that's the key, right? And she's gotta do the same. And when, when that's, it doesn't mean every day's perfect, but when it's not, we're, there's collision, you know? When, when I've gotten my self-interest and she has her self-interest, yeah, there's conflict, collision, and, and what have you. But when we lay that down, there's service to one another. And if people could just get that one idea and then seek to live that out, it would take a, a struggling marriage or a difficult marriage to a whole other level, I believe. And then here's the thing, right? When you take that into the bedroom, as a husband and wife, you didn't know I was going here, right? Yeah. But when you take that into the bedroom, that mindset, I'm here to serve her versus take from her, that changes the dynamic of the, your intimacy as husband and wife as well. So we don't have to overcomplicate it if we're willing to lay ourselves down and, and continue to serve each other no matter the environment we're facing. All right, all right. Hey, it's good to see you. My name is Roger. Grab your Bible if you have one with you, maybe on your phone. Uh, know that there's the City Rise app where there's the fill-in notes and the scripture. All that is there. Uh, go to the West U page there, but follow along with us. We are so glad that you are here today. So many new faces. I have met people from all over the world today, and it is so cool and it's so humbling. Can I do something? If you were born outside of the United States, would you just stand to your feet? We just want to welcome you. If you're born outside the U.S., Look here, all right, come on. That's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Yeah, God bless you. It is so good. The, the nations are here, right here in the heart of Houston, Texas, and we are glad you're with us. Uh, I've got a little bit too much in my monitors behind me or something. If we can fix that on the soundboard, I appreciate that. Uh, we're in Ephesians chapter five, Ephesians chapter five, and we're in a series called The Flourishing Family. And uh, we're talking last week and this week and one more time next week a little bit about marriage, all right? And as we're talking about marriage, i got a couple of things. Some of you are like, well, hang on, I'm young and I'm single and I'm, I'm in high school, I'm this, or I'm that, I don't need to talk on marriage. And some of you are like, hey, we're happily married, I don't need to talk on marriage. Or hey, my marriage didn't go well and I'm divorced, I don't need to talk on marriage today. And hey, I'm this, I'm that. Listen, we all need to talk on marriage because it is the foundation of our society. 
the home. The, the home is the foundation of society. So whether you're happily married, never married, uh, uh, you want to get married, or, or anywhere in between on that, here's the thing. We've got to talk about this. Matter of fact, the, the culture's talking a lot about it. Churches are divided over who they can marry, who they should marry, etc. We're just going to look at the scripture, and we're going to talk about how do we have a flourishing family and the cornerstone of a flourishing family in families where there's a husband and wife in marriage is the husband-wife relationship. So that's where we're headed today. And the big idea is we're learning to serve. We're learning to serve. God, teach me to serve, uh, and, uh, and it'll add value to your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for today, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the privilege of being in the house of the Lord today. Father, we give you all praise. Lord Jesus, we give you praise. Spirit of God, we ask you to fill us. We ask you to lead us, guide and direct us, teach us, convict us, challenge us, change us. May the word of Christ come forth and give us faith, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mrs. Timkins one morning asked her husband, Honey, do you not remember what today is? And he looked at her, of course I remember. I remember what today is. He goes, it was actually my first thought, or my last thought last night is about to go to sleep. And my first thought today was about to this day and how significant it is. I want you to go out and I want you to buy a brand new dress. And we're going to make reservations tonight at our favorite restaurant. And I'm going to spend some money on you. I'm, we are going to celebrate. About a week later, Mrs. Timpkins is gathering for a little bridge match with her friends, and she goes, that was the best Groundhog Day I've ever had. <laughs> for y'all that are born outside the U.S., Groundhog Day is this kind of hokey holiday we have here. But anyway, uh, if you have somebody who's going to fawn all over you on Groundhog Day, you've got a winner right there. We are talking about having the power for marriage and this flourishing home and, and learning to serve. I want you to look with me at Ephesians 5. Now in Ephesians 5, you normally have verse 22, wives submit to your husbands. In verse 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. But what I want to do is I want to back up. I want to go to verse 15 and following. And I want to dig through verse 25. And I want to show you how all of this is one continuous thought. Ephesians 5, <clears throat> 15 through 25. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, uh, to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence, for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What I want us to do today is I want us to look at the prevailing attitude that should be in the home. In a, in a flourishing family, in a flourishing husband-wife relationship, the prevailing attitude that should be in the home is found in verse 21. Verse 21 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul is saying, let me bring this amazing principle of the kingdom of God into, uh, into our homes and into our marriages. See, the, the heart that has been grabbed hold of by the gospel of Jesus, the heart that is being transformed by the gospel of Jesus is a heart that realizes there must be radical change. And that radical change is in how we treat one another. How we treat one another. Putting the needs of others before our own, and in doing so, we are following Christ. Example, see if the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, as Jesus proclaimed about his life, shouldn't that be the testimony of our lives? We didn't come to be served, but we came to serve. Tim Keller in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, says to start arguing about the gender roles is a mistake that will be fatal to any true grasp of Paul's point. Only if you've learned to serve others by the power of the Holy Spirit will you have the power to face the challenges 
of marriage. So if you're married, let me ask this question. Are you found humbly serving your spouse? If you're like me, you're going to be like, some days I am. A lot of days I'm not. Yes, I did yesterday. Oh, I failed to today. We, 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 we pass the test some days, other days we struggle to humbly serve. And so as we dig into this, let's ask the question, why? Why is this the case? What keeps us from living this way? Why do we struggle to humbly serve our spouse? Now, last week when I was at our Crosspoint campus here in Bel Air, I taught on uh, how we struggle uh, in marriage because of sin. There is a, a mindset in marriage called the me marriage. And the me marriage isn't about us. It's not about the institution of marriage. It's about what I'll get out of marriage. And let me just tell you, Stephanie, you, you're a counselor. You know, if this is how people step into marriage, this is not, this is not how to win. If you're all about you and not about us, you're going to struggle in this thing called marriage. This is not about me. It's about us, right? And that, and so we got to understand selfishness rears its head. Selfishness in marriage is the enemy to a great marriage. And it rears its head. I'm going to give you four ways that selfishness, selfishness shows its head in marriage. Number one is pride. Pride. Pride is our nature. Adam and Eve, they're like, we want to be like God. Yeah, we're here. He created us. But I want to be like God. And his, their desire to be like God, their pride affected their relationship with God and it affected their relationship to one another. And oftentimes that's the root struggle. Well, you know, pastor, I'll serve her when she does this for me. <laughs> pastor, I'll serve him when he does this for me. And we're keeping score about all the bad things we do one to the other. And I'm not moving an inch until I see them moving my way. Listen to me, that's pride talking. If that's how you think, and if that's the language you're using, that's pride. Your pride is getting in the way of progress. Now, that doesn't mean they don't need to work on some things, but your pride is getting in the way. The second way selfishness rears its head in marriage is past wounds, past wounds, right? Everybody comes into marriage with some sort of, uh, certainly plenty of experience, sometimes baggage. And it could be from a past relationship, could be from your family of origin or, or a combination thereof. We all come into marriage with something and we, we drop that bag right in the middle of the marriage. But you know, I mean, when you're engaged, everything's perfect, you know? It's like, it's just like perfect. It's so perfect that, that you don't even see the bag that that other person's carrying, you know, alongside with you. And, and it's just so, it's just so good. I mean, that, that, no, they'll leave that, they'll leave that bag outside of our relationship. I, I know, because when we get married, it'll fix everything. That's the mindset we often have. Well, just our getting married, I mean, look, give them to me for the rest of our lives. I'll work on them, I'll fix them. No, you're not the Holy Spirit. You won't. You certainly are going to try, but you won't. And that in itself is going to be a problem. See, not only will that not fix your problems, when they bring their stuff to your marriage and you bring it to y'all's marriage and you bring your stuff, y'all just have more stuff. And so, and so just know that past wounds uh, in marriage can make us very selfish. The third way that selfishness rears its head in marriage is through fear through fear. Because of our sin and because of our past wounds, the fear exists. Uh, uh, fear exists because we don't want to feel rejected. We long for unconditional love, and yet because we're afraid, we're going we're gonna to put walls up. And here's the thing. Fear and intimacy do not coexist. They can't. Fear and intimacy can't coexist. And so, and so you've got to give, you got to get past the fear that you might give yourself fully to one another. The fourth way selfishness is seen in marriage is through control. So when issues arise in marriage, rather uh, than dealing with the root problem, rather than dealing with our selfishness by humbling ourselves before God and humbling ourselves to our spouse, many people try to just grab hold of things, take matters into their own hands, make all the decisions and become control freaks. Well, I'm just telling you, this is a surefire way to ruin your marriage. If you're in control, if you're a control freak in your marriage, your marriage is a me marriage and it is all about you. And this is something you need God to work on. So what's the point, Pastor? Well, here it is. 
We have to deal with our selfishness if we want to have a satisfying marriage. We have to deal with our selfishness if we're to have a satisfying marriage. One author says it this way. If two spouses each say, I'm going to treat my self-centeredness as the main problem in my marriage, you have the prospect of a truly great marriage. You heard me say on the video, here's my problem. I have too much of me in me. And that's just true. That's my starting point. Let me just be the lead one here saying, I've got these issues in my marriage and my, the problems in my marriage, they start with me. That's where I'm going to start. I'm the main problem in my home, in my marriage. And if that's your starting point, then you're doing your part. Now the spouse, if they start there as well, then they're doing their part. So how do we deal with selfishness? In our marriage, really in all relationships, but how do we deal with selfishness? Is there an antidote? Because really what, what you would say is, well, pastor, what you're saying is instead of selfish, I need to be selfless. There you go. You, you hit it, right? How do I do that? We've got to learn to serve. We've got to learn to serve. So let me give you four principles about serving. A selfless marriage requires, number one, fearing Christ. This is in verse 21. So we're going to start in verse 21, and we're going to back our way up through Ephesians 5. A selfless marriage requires fearing Christ. Notice what it says in verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This whole section is introduced by saying, out of reverence for Christ, we submit to one another. The word reverence here is fear. And it means to be overwhelmed by or controlled by something. Rather than seeking to exercise control to have our needs met, we actually give up control that we might be so overwhelmed and controlled by the God who loves us unconditionally. And He is meeting our needs. And instead of looking to our spouse to meet our needs, we see our spouse as our blessing. God, your job is to meet my needs. And therefore, you've given me this gift, this blessing in my husband, in my wife. So we give up control, and we're controlled by our Lord, and we let him meet our needs. There's a story of Zacchaeus. You know Zacchaeus in children's Sunday school, the Bible story about Zacchaeus, the wee little man. The wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, and the Lord he wanted to see. And if you know the song, you can sing it with me. And then one day he was, I don't know, I don't even know the words anymore. But Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. Jesus encounters this wee little man named Zacchaeus and he goes to his house and Zacchaeus' life is changed forever. One day his wife follows him. She keeps like, why is he grabbing that bucket? He grabs his bucket and he goes out and he fills it with water and she just follows along and he goes to that sycamore tree outside that city where he met Jesus and he just he pours that bucket of water on those roots. She's like, what are you doing? Honey, this is the tree. This is the place where I met Jesus. This is where my life changed. And I want to make sure that this tree every day gets water because I don't ever want to lose sight of the way he's radically changed my life. I want it to grow just as I want to grow. All too often we meet Jesus and we move on. We don't, we don't let growth take hold in our lives. We don't let it shape us. We don't, we don't let the Lordship of Christ have his way. We, I mean, we've got Christ in our life. We're saved, but he's sitting over here on the side and we're, we're still calling all the shots. And when did you meet Jesus? Well, I was a teenager. Good. What happened to my, well, here's how, and here's my story and all this. Okay, great. Good. How has he changed you? Well, yeah, I mean, he's in my life. I'm going to heaven. Okay, but is he Lord of your life? I mean, that's the real thing here. We gotta let Jesus be Lord of, of our life. Because when he's Lord, he's calling the shots and he's saying, hey, hey, big guy, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta back up here. You can't say that like that you did. You hurt her with your words. You need to do this. You, need, you know, he's, he's informing our way through the scripture and through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll get there in a second. We gotta choose his Lordship and we follow so that we're prepared to serve. And we got to let him have his way. So until God has the proper place in our lives, we're often looking at our spouse complaining that they're not meeting our needs. He's not meeting my needs. She's not meeting my needs. He's not loving me well enough. She's not loving me well enough. 
Well, the way to experience the selfless uh, uh, marriage is to make sure that we fear our Lord. Submit to one another. Notice this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. To submit is to lower yourself. To submit is to say there's, a, there's someone else in authority. And the Scripture's call to husbands and wives is that you mutually submit to one another. Now, when you study the Scripture and you study the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the 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 one God who has three distinct personalities, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You see, this is the very nature of God. And submission in our culture is a bad word. Don't submit. You rise up. You this, you that. It's all about you. But if you're going to be Christ-like, if you're going to be godly like God, then you choose the way of submission. How? Well, how did Jesus do it? I, I see what the Father wants for me, and that I listen, and, and I only do what He wants, right? How else? Jesus and the Spirit of God submitted to one another. It, Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus was dependent upon the Spirit through His ministry. He was crucified in the Spirit. He was raised to life in the Spirit. Jesus models to us how to walk with the Spirit of God all the days of our life. But Jesus and the Father, it's called the doctrine of double procession, they give the Spirit. Right? So the Spirit of God is submissive to the Son of God and the Father. So the Father, the source of all authority, gives authority to the Son and the Spirit. The Son and the Spirit give obedience back to the Father, and they mutually submit to one another. The Godhead is the, the way God functions in perfect unity is the picture for us of how we're to do it. We're to lower ourselves because of love. Not to raise up ourselves, we're to lower ourselves. That's number one. Number two, a selfless marriage requires continual filling of the Holy Spirit. A continual filling of the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul says here, don't be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. External substances aren't to control us. And if that's an issue for you, we want to help you. We want to help you find the, the, the resources you need. If, if you get drunk with wine on a frequent basis, you're not one. The scripture says don't. Number two, it says watch out. Wine is a mocker. Beer is a brawler. Whoever's led astray by them is not wise. If your husband's going, hey, that's you, or your wife's going, hey, that's you, if, hey, you got a problem, then you need to own that. Not only are you not to walk in that way, we can help you get deliverance in that. But number two, instead, you're to be filled with the Spirit. We're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It, it, Jesus tells us the ministry of the Holy Spirit in John 14 and in John chapter 16. Uh, and the role of the Holy Spirit is he takes the truth of, truth of Jesus and he makes it known to us. Look at this in John 14, 26 and 27. But the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The first thing you need to know about the Holy Spirit is he's not an it, he's a he. He's the person of the Godhead. What does Jesus say here? He will teach you all things, number one. Number two, his role is to teach us, is to lead us into truth. Number three, he gives us his peace. The Holy Spirit wants to be your best friend. He's just waiting on you to sit with him. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is so significant. It is better for me to leave you and go away, that, I'm, that the Father might send the counselor, the helper to you. Jesus said, it's better for me to go away that you might receive the Holy Spirit. That's is what he says here. So when we're filled with the Spirit, our, our, our focus is not ourselves. Our focus is on the Lord. Now, you guys have heard me say this one little hack I like to do is to, is to, is to serve my wife coffee every morning. And uh, it's my kind of reminder. It's my kind of reminder that I, I'm here to serve her. And so, and then and you, you heard us talk a little bit about that. And you're like, oh, okay, big deal. You make your wife call me. Okay. Yeah. 
I get it. No, that's cool. I get it. I get it. I get it. Well, you've said it more than once. Yeah, I get it. No, I have. I have. And, and, and one Valentine's Day, I, brought my, I bought my wife this mug. Has her name on it. Got half of a heart. You know? This was a good one, wasn't it? What was in the mug? You tell them. For y'all who are watching online, she just said Garth Brooks tickets to the rodeo. Guys, Valentine's Day comes before the rodeo. So if you ever want to just like, like two birds, one stone, rodeo tickets in a mug like this on Valentine's Day change the trajectory of your marriage, right? And so, so I, love to, I love to serve my wife coffee. I just like, hey, here, I'm here to serve you. You're like, okay, great, 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 great. But you know what I've never shared with you? I've never shared with you what I do before I give her her coffee. Because here's the thing. I love coffee. I have my coffee before I share her, give her her coffee. Yeah, and I, I, got, a, I got a mug for me too. It's, it's, uh, it's got my name on it. And, and it's the other side of the heart, right? And, uh, and, and, and so before I ever serve her her coffee, I serve me my coffee. You're like, Pastor, isn't that the opposite of what you're talking about? Oh, no, hang on. Just stay with me. I'm usually up before she is, and, and she's getting ready for work, and I'm, I'm, I'm making coffee. I'm making lunches. But I'm also, I'm also sitting with Jesus with this cup of coffee, and I'm sitting in a chair, and, I'm, and I've got the Scriptures open. I have the Bible in my lap, and I'm, and I'm praying. And there's a little review of the, the previous day and my words and my actions and, and, and how did I do and what my thoughts. And, and I'm letting the Lord speak into my life on that. And, and I'm like, ooh, that hurt. Okay, Lord, you're right. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And, and, and then I'm, I'm looking at the Scripture and what do you have to say to me? And I, you, you know me. I'm going to start in Proverbs. Such good stuff. Proverbs 14, 15, 16. Whatever day of the month it is, I'm in that day of Proverbs. And then I'm digging into something else, okay? And, and, then, and then I try to, like Job, I, try to, I just try to be the priest of my home and I try to cover my family in prayer. And so before I'm, before I'm filling her coffee mug or making her lunch or dinner, I am begging God for his protection over my family. And I, I'm praying for her and her day. And I'm praying for my, my son Brady, my son Cooper, my daughter Carson. I'm praying God's, God's protection over us. And I'm praying God's provision in our lives. And I'm praying that temptation stays away from our, I'm praying disease that stays away from our home. I'm just, I'm asking God to put a covering. I'm just begging God to watch over them as they go out into the world and live their lives. And that's, that's, that's how I'm having my coffee. And after that, then I say, and now God, I lay my life down because I'm the problem. I've got too much of me in me. And so, Lord, I, I'm, I'm just going to lay myself down and I'm going to ask you to fill me up. I need you to fill me up. Spirit of God, fill me up. And then today, in acts of service, would you, would you pour me out? Fill me up and pour me out. That's the prayer I pray before I preach every Sunday. God, would you fill me up and would you pour me out? Would you fill me up and would you pour me out? God, you've given me a word. You've given me something for these folks. I have no idea what's going on in their lives, but God, would you fill me up and you would pour me out because you know what's going on in their lives. But it would be a crime to pray that over you and what we do here and not first pray that and do that in my own home. I want everything to align. So, so here it is. It's me and Jesus. We're hanging out. Then it's, then it's me and Julie. We're hanging out. Then it's our family. And then it's out from there. And that's the order. And we'll talk about priorities in just a moment, right? But I, to be who God wants me to be, I have to lay my life down. I'm the problem in my marriage. And so are you. And I have to say, Spirit of God, only you can equip me and prepare me and fill me and use me. So fill me up and pour me out. Number three, a selfless marriage requires walking in wisdom. It requires walking in wisdom. 
Notice this in verses 15 through 17. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Can you and I just agree the days are evil? Okay, I got one. Anybody else? The days are evil. I don't know if you're paying attention to much, but they're, they're evil. They're evil. Okay, so what do we do? Well, recognize what the Lord's will is, number one, and make the best use of your time. So things that really don't matter, that really doesn't need to be our focus. We need to focus in on what matters most in our lives. What matters most in light of our relationship to our Lord. What matters most in light of our relationship to our spouse, if we're married. What what matters most in relationship to our children, if we have them. What matters most in relationship to the calling God has placed on my life and how I live that out in the world. That's what I'm to focus in on. I need to recognize that to make the best use of my time. So the things of lesser importance, I'm not going to let them dominate my thinking. I'm not going to let them dominate uh, uh, my, my mindset, my time, and my energy. Instead, I'm going to make sure I have put the proper energy into the things that matter most. Me and Jesus, me and Julie, me and my children, out to you all. Which starts with our staff, out to our leadership, then through the body of Christ. And that goes out through the world. That goes out into our community and out to the world, all over the world. We have a team just got back from Kenya. So over 300 people in a medical clinic, 65 people gave their life to Jesus on that trip. We praise God for that. Lots going on all over the world. Over 250 people sent around the world this summer. And it humbles me that it all starts with hanging out with Jesus Christ. It all starts right there. And if any of that other stuff is going to get prevented from happening, he's going to come at the marriage relationship. He's going to come at my children. He's going to come at our home. So we better rise up and we better put a defense. We better have that prayer time. We better put a shield over our home of prayer, right? That's that's how we're to do it. So we got to focus on the most important things and and make sure we have the right priorities. And when we don't have the right priorities, we're selfish. We're well, we're all about me. Well, I want to go, I want to go fishing. I haven't been fishing in a while and I'm going. I want to hunt. I want to this, I want to that. When you say I, 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 that's a me marriage. That's a problem. You have too much of you and you. C.S. Lewis says it this way, look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you're running after, you're worried about, you're fretting over. He'll take care of those. Matthew 6, 33. So wise people prioritize. They prioritize Christ and the kingdom. They prioritize their spouse if they're married, their children if they have them, and then everything else, right? So, well, pastor, I'm not married. Well, good. You and Jesus, hang out. He'll get you ready for whatever's next. He'll prepare. He'll be preparing you for this spouse he has for you, right? Or he'll be preparing you for those grandchildren that you're going to pour into, the marriage you're going to influence that's a couple of generations away. It's, it's still, it's you and Jesus. It all starts right there to impact your relationships. All right, number, number, number four. Number four. Selfless marriage requires, and we're almost done, walking in love. Walking in love. Ephesians 4, verse 32. So back up into the beginning of this chapter, to, to chapter 5, verse 2. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love because a selfless marriage requires walking in love. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, here's the thing, right? You see the, the two little and the, the heart and how that's cool that is, right? But one of us, if one of us comes to serve and the other one's not, collision, collision, collision. It takes both, right? Both of us coming together to mutually serve each other out of reverence for Jesus that we can create this environment where we can flourish. And so the call here is to walk in love. And then he says, in case you don't know what that looks like, it looks like Jesus and his sacrifice for you. Paul the Apostle in Philippians chapter 2 really makes this known. Flip over one page to Philippians chapter 2 in your scripture. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Here's a playbook for marriage. If you need a playbook, here's your playbook right here. 
I mean, you just do, you study this, you know this, you memorize this, you live this, you're going to do great. You're going to do great. Philippians 2, and we'll be done. 1 through 11. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others, uh, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, <clears throat> which is yours in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It, it, we're to walk in love as Christ loved us. This is how he loved us. He emptied himself. He became nothing. He stepped out of his heavenly glory and, and took on flesh. And he came, came to serve. I didn't come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what he's done. So what do we see here? Number one, if you have any benefit of being a Christian, a Christ follower, number one, be unified. Be of the same mind. We're mutually serving each other. Number two, don't be selfish. Quit living in me marriage. Quit being so selfish. Number three, look not only to your own interests. It's easy. We naturally do that. But look to the interests of others. And number four, have a Jesus mindset. Notice what it says in verse five. This mind, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You've got to have a Jesus mindset. And what is that mindset? I've come to serve, not be served. I'm lowering myself. I'm emptying myself. I'm dying to myself. That's the call. And guys, let me say a word to you. Ladies, y'all don't have to pay attention to this. Men, listen to me. It's your job to start. You go first. It's your job to lead the way. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Men, lead out. Rise up. And the way up in the kingdom is down. Love your wife like Jesus loves you. You're doing your part. You'll be doing your, your part. So, so, so you're like, okay, what do you want me to do? All right, three things. Here we go and we're done. One, reorder your priorities. Check your priorities. Reorder your priorities. Number two, identify selfishness. Identify areas where you're selfish and, and, and confess them to God and to your spouse. Uh, you, you, great conversation at lunch here. Hey, honey, uh, is there anything I'm doing you want me to change? You know, dare you to try that. A um, lot of grace there. Number three, be intentional. Be intentional. Listen, every day is an opportunity to build your marriage. You know that? But every day is also an opportunity to tear it down. You either build or tear down your marriage. And you'll do that with your mouth and you'll do that with your actions. So build. Build well. Every single day is a chance to build. So be a builder. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for this moment in time that we get to be together. Thank you for my bride. She's amazing. What a gift you've given me. Lord, I pray blessing in this church and on homes and in marriages across our city because we look to you and what you have to say. Uh, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship our Lord together in song.